Turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're coming close to the end of the letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. This morning we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 18. You know, in the Advent season when we celebrate Christmas, this is a, a traditionally a time when families get to come together and be together. But for some people, this is a very difficult time. It's a lonely time. It's a desperate time. And for Paul, this is a difficult moment in his life and in his ministry. But he is going to make some final requests that I think are going to help us for the rest of our life. I'm entitling this message, Paul's Final Request, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 18. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for this church and its ministers. Lord, I pray for the pastors and the leaders, the men and the women. Lord, I pray for everyone who calls Calvary South Denver home. Lord, I pray that it would continue to be a church dedicated, focused on the word of God. And Heavenly Father, again, we pray as men and women for a willingness to embrace hardship, to persevere in difficulty, and again, to be a place where the word of God is taught. Lord, we commit this time to you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 9, Paul, writing to Timothy, says, Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmysia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he's useful to me for ministry. And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas. When you come and the books, especially the parchments, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. In this last chapter, Paul makes some final charges in verse 1 and 2 and in verse 5. And here, Timothy is to preach the word of God in verse 2. The pastor's main tool, the pastor's main tool in his tool bag is God's word. And like a Swiss army knife or a multi-tool, the Bible is used for a lot of different things, for correction, instruction, rebuke, encouragement in verse 2. Timothy is tasked to preach to preach urgently and at all times. There's a final warning. Men are going to abandon sound doctrine, but they won't just simply abandon sound doctrine. They're going to embrace false doctrine, satanic doctrine in verses 3 and 4. 
And so in our passage, Paul is going to name names. He's going to warn Timothy to beware of a godless coppersmith by the name of Alexander in verses 14 and 15. Paul is going to give a final testimony. Remember, in this chapter, he's fought the good fight in verses 6 and 7. He's finished the cause. He's kept the faith. With eager anticipation, he contemplates his final reward. He calls it a crown of righteousness in verse 8. And now, again, he lays out some final requests. And that word can be a scary word. Final. It sounds so final. And as I was preparing this message, I remembered that 10,000 plus preachers are going to be preaching this morning. And for some of them, it's their final sermon. And by the way, every single person who preaches the gospel will one day deliver their final message, their final sermon. And so I purposed in my heart to make sure that each and every time I have given the privilege to preach, I want to preach like it's the last time. I want to be able to say what needs to be said as if it's never been said before. And so, Paul's final request involved individuals and items. Paul is going to ask Timothy to make his way to Paul as soon as possible in verse 9. He asks Timothy, please bring Mark with you in verse 11. Paul sends Tychicus to Ephesus in verse 12. It could very well be that Tychicus is going to be the bearer of important documents and also that he's going to replace Timothy as Timothy returns hopefully to Rome in order to fulfill Paul's wishes. The items that Paul asks for are a cloak in verse 13, his study books in verse 13, the Old Testament scrolls, perhaps, in verse 13. There's a final request, but there's also a final sorrow. Demas has forsaken him, in verse 10. His Roman friends have left him, in verse 16. But there's also a final song. A song of joy, a song of praise, a song of deliverance. The song's theme resonates throughout all of history. And that God has delivered Paul from the lion in verse 17 and 18. And will deliver Paul into the kingdom of heaven. In this letter, Paul tells Timothy. At the very beginning in the first chapter, guard the treasure. And remember, the treasure isn't just the gifts that we receive at Christmas time. The treasure that he's talking about is the inestimable treasure of the gospel. Guard the treasure. What is the treasure? The treasure is the thing that makes life possible and salvation possible and friendship and relationship with God possible. He says, guard the treasure. He also says... Preach the word, suffer hardship, persevere. Paul began the chapter by telling Timothy, preach the word in verses 1 through 4. Fulfill your ministry in verses 5 through 8. Please come quickly to me in Rome in verses 9 through 18. And so look again in verse 9. Be diligent. To come to me quickly. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved the present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmysia. Verse 11 Only Luke is with me. Get Mark, bring him with you, for he's useful to me for ministry. And Tychicus, I've sent to Ephesus. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas. When you come, 
and the books, especially the parchments. So why does Paul ask Timothy, please, please come quickly? What's the sense of urgency? Why does Paul feel this sense of urgency? Because Demas has forsaken Paul. Crescens, by the way, his Latin, it's a Latin name. It was a common name in the Latin language. It meant ever increasing. And Titus, they were busy ministering in other areas in verse 10. Paul says, Dr. Luke is with him. And I got to tell you something, if you find yourself in prison or in hospice or in a difficult situation, it's great to have a doctor around who can also pray for you. And Luke is a blessing. But Paul longs for a certain kind of companionship and fellowship. He longs for companionship and fellowship with a person who's accompanied him throughout his ministry. It's his son in the faith, Timothy. Later in this chapter, in verse 21, if you take a quick peek ahead, Paul will write, do your utmost. Please come before winter. The reason why he'll say that later is because in the Mediterranean world, the ports shut down. At at wintertime, the the waves were too violent and, and the Mediterranean was difficult to navigate because the ports and the shipping lanes shut down. Then that would probably mean that it would be too late. If Timothy doesn't leave by winter, the chances of Paul surviving much longer are slim to none. And so, Paul wants Timothy to come so that he can spend some final moments with him, so that he can be with him. Even though he has served as mentor and spiritual father. In Timothy's life, Paul has been the sage on the stage. But it's about to come to an end. We're not sure of what time of the year that Paul wrote this letter. If it was spring the letter would still have to be carried by Tychicus, arrive in Ephesus, be given to Timothy, and then allow Timothy time to return. But we have no evidence whatsoever that Paul, Paul's request was ever honored. We have no evidence whatsoever that this situation was ever resolved in such a way that Paul's wishes came true. And as Paul is awaiting trial, we understand a couple of things. You may not know this, but we have a great deal of information of what the legal system was like in the Roman Empire in the first century. It was complex. There were postponements and delays. Paul is not sure if whether or not the postponements and delays are going to be such that he is going to have the opportunity to see his friend and companion. And just like in ministry, there are joys and there are sorrows. There are difficulties. And so it's important that you understand something. Sebastian hinted at it. Pastors and missionaries and church workers experience the full range of emotion just like you. Sometimes it's funny being the pastor. I love being the pastor of this church. By the way, the great privilege of my life was when my wife said, yes, I'll go with you. I'll go with you to New Mexico. I'll go with you to Colorado. Guess what? If she had not said yes, if she said no, I wouldn't be here. This church wouldn't be here. You would be somewhere, but you wouldn't be here. She said yes. 
The other great privilege of my life is being the father of my son, Miguel, and Anthony, and Jonathan. What a great privilege. But the other exciting privilege is being the pastor of this church, of being here, of ministering to you, of praying with you, of marrying some of you, of burying people in your family, of visiting you in the hospital and being with you through life's difficulties. But the truth is, pastors, missionaries, church workers can also experience times of isolation and loneliness and abandonment. There are times in people's lives where we come together and we want that sense of friendship and fellowship and relationship. But for some, even coming to church is difficult. I happen to know that some people watching this broadcast right at this moment when they see the children singing or they even hear the words Christmas Eve service, they realize that this is the very first year that they're without their husband, they're without their wife, they're without a child. It's a difficult time and a painful time. What will Paul do? Paul, even in these closing moments, has a choice to either build bridges or walls. C.S. Lewis wrote, quote, when we're born, we're born helpless. As soon as we're fully conscious, we discover loneliness. We need others physically and emotionally and intellectually. We need them if we are to know anything, even about ourselves, unquote. In verse 10, when Paul says, for Demas has forsaken me. This is the Demas who's mentioned in Colossians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. He's also mentioned in Philemon chapter 1, verse 24. Philemon only has one chapter. In the Colossians passage, Paul, along with Demas, mentions Tychicus in verses 7 and 8. Onesimus in verse 9. Aristarchus and Mark in, in verse 10. Justice in verse 11. Epaphras. And then Demas in verse 14. What's interesting to me about that list in the book of Colossians, it was probably written about 60 AD, and it was during Paul's first Roman imprisonment. This is his second Roman imprisonment, which means that that these men have surrounded him in ministry and been with him for many years. Sometimes the people you start with aren't the people you end with. And we sometimes think of Paul as being invulnerable. He's the apostle sent by Jesus himself, but he suffers the attacks of the enemy. He is no stranger to persecution. He has embraced his imprisonment, but Paul also leaves a clue, at least in part, in what's going on inside of his heart. Paul uses a term in the Greek language which is very strong. It's the Greek word ekkat. Aleppo. It translates the word forsake. In its context, depending on what that context is, it can mean to desert. It can mean to leave helpless. It can mean to totally abandon. Demas has forsaken me. In the book of Philemon, Demas is called an approved worker, a co-laborer. But now he's a deserter. The reason Paul gives us is sufficiently vague to leave us wondering, having loved this present world, he's departed for Thessalonica. What does that mean? What are we to take from that sentence? 
does he go without Paul's permission? Because clearly the others are going on a task, a specific task that seems to be ordered and ordained by God. Was Demas ashamed of Paul's trial? Was he ashamed of Paul's imprisonment? Was he ashamed of their relationship? Was he too afraid that he himself might face persecution or isolation or execution? We have no reason to believe that Demas has abandoned the faith. But we have every reason to believe that he's abandoned Paul. And Paul writes about it. And he's hurt by it. That word in its context seems to mean totally abandoned. Utterly forsaken. That the void and the emptiness is almost too much to bear. But even as he thinks about the loneliness and the, the isolation and the abandonment, he remembers, he remembers not just about the people who gave up, but he remembers the people who held on. And that becomes a clue. That becomes a way of thinking about when you're facing loneliness or isolation or abandonment instead of focusing simply on the people who gave up and left. We think about the people who hung in and stayed. The people who were faithfully serving the Lord. Paul has no words of censure or rebuke for Crescens or Titus who were sent to the Roman provinces of Galatia and Dalmatia. By the way, Galatia, depending on... uh, Different scholars have different views. Some people believe that it's a a reference to Gaul. I suspect that it really isn't, that it's a a reference to Galatia, which is in modern Turkey or or ancient Anatolia. It was part of that area that the, the letter of Galatians was written to. Dalmatia incorporates what you and I would call modern Croatia, Slovenia, what's commonly called the Baltic states. And in verse 11, it would seem that when Paul says, only Luke is with me, that the good doctor is determined to maintain contact with Paul throughout his final imprisonment. Some scholars have suggested that both the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts were written by Luke as a legal brief for Paul's first trial. This might come as a shock and a surprise to you, but the more I read and the more I study, the more convinced I am that the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts were written in part as a, a brief that was to be submitted to the Roman court to a person who's called... I know his name. Yeah, his name means lover of God, Theophilus. Thank you. Thank you for saying Theophilus. I hate getting old. (laughs) Mary and I were at Sweet Tomatoes yesterday. And so we're in line. We're getting ready to pay. And and the girl says, "I, I don't mean to be rude, but... Are you eligible for the senior discount? (laughs) And of course I said, don't let our youthful appearance fool you. Yes, we are eligible. We are eligible for that senior discount. Luke has probably written the book of Luke and and, and the book of Acts as a legal brief at the first trial. I suspect strongly that this is a separate imprisonment and a separate trial. In Colossians chapter 4 verse 14, Paul refers to Luke as a beloved physician. That's how we know he was a doctor. He is a physician, a historian, a faithful companion in Christ. And Paul references Mark, John Mark. Most people who are familiar with the New Testament, they're aware 
of the book of Acts and they're aware of Paul and Mark's falling out. The events recorded in Acts chapter 15 verses 36 through 41. And the disagreement was less about doctrine and more about relationship. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, Barnabas, who was Paul's traveling companion, was uncle to John Mark, who would later write the gospel of Mark and who would be a close companion of Peter at the end of his life. Mark left the team in Perga. He makes his way home. And when it came time to form yet another missionary team, a second missionary team, Barnabas says we should take Mark with us. And Paul, still stinging from the abandonment in the first missionary journey, says no. The issue was resolved or left unresolved. When Paul leaves for Syria and Cilicia and Silas with Silas and Barnabas and Mark leave and they go to Cyprus, we don't know what happens with Barnabas and Mark because the Holy Spirit doesn't follow Barnabas and Mark. They follow Paul and Silas into the journey at Antioch. Now, this all happened when Paul and Barnabas were ministering in Antioch. And this is the time that's spoken about in the book of Galatians when Peter comes to Antioch and the Judaizers are making inroads, legalists are making inroads into the church. And Paul writes in Galatians chapter 2, verse 13, that even Barnabas is carried away with all of this Jewish, messianic stuff. I have absolutely nothing against the Jewish roots of Christianity. But Paul is staking his life on the fact that Christians are saved by grace through faith and that not of themselves. That Christianity isn't a set of legal observances. That Christianity is based... <coughs> on having a right relationship with Jesus through Jesus Christ the Lord, that we're saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. Paul's making it clear that whatever happened in the past, whatever's gone wrong, what, whatever challenge has gone under the river, Paul is now making it clear that he wants dear friends who may have been separated in the past to come together. And everyone reading that particular passage of scripture, when they read the tender words of Paul, please, please, Bring Mark with you. He's useful to me. If you've ever disappointed someone, or if anyone has ever disappointed you, if you've ever counted on someone, or if they've ever counted on you, and you were disappointed, or they were disappointed, there comes a time in our lives where we need to put our differences aside. Usually it's going to come when there's isolation and there's pain and there's difficulty. You may not be able to see it, but I'm going to say it out loud. Paul is asking for help. That's what he's doing. He's asking for help. Sometimes when we find ourselves in trouble, we need to ask for help. As hard as it is, as hard as it is to tell people, I'm in a difficult place, I'm in a lonely place, I'm in a broken place. In verse 12, it says, and Tychicus I've sent to Ephesus. And by the way, Tychicus was a proven minister. He was a trusted companion. He was an able messenger. We learn that in Acts chapter 20, verse 4, where it's always Tychicus's job when Paul says, I'm sending someone to you. I'm either going to send Timothy or I'm going to send Tychicus. I'm going to send someone who I can count on, who I know is going to have your best ministry interest in mind. 
It seems that Tychicus is tasked with delivering the letter to the Ephesians in chapter 6, verse 21, and Colossians in chapter 4, verse 7. We don't know if Tychicus has already left or whether he has in fact left and he's making his way in Ephesus to, to tell Timothy just how important it is for him to be with him. Again, it would seem that Tychicus, his ministry was a ministry of strengthening pastors so that they could strengthen churches. And it seems to me that as I was reading this text that that might be part of my own future role. As much as I've loved being the pastor of this church, that maybe in this new season of service, part of my ministry is going to be like Tychicus, to strengthen pastors so that we can strengthen churches. In Titus chapter 3, verse 12, Paul writes, quote, When I sent Artemis to you, or Tychicus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, For I've decided to spend the winter there. That was written about (coughs) 65 AD. When he wrote those words, he had probably left and then made his way back to Rome and then was publicly arrested. In the Roman judicial system, if a person was accusing you of a crime, they went to you in public and they could compel you to go to court. And if you refused, they could get a magistrate and bring that person to you. In verse 13, when Paul says, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come and the books, especially the... the, 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 the uh, especially the parchments. Paul asks for a cloak. The cloak, that word is used only here in the Greek New Testament, but what it was, it was a word that described an outer garment. In the ancient world, they didn't shop at Kohl's or Macy's. They didn't have a walk-in closet. It was very, very unusual for a person to have two or three changes of clothes. So if this particular garment is the outer garment, it would have been like a heavy blanket with a hole at the top, almost like a Mexican serape. Some of you have seen it. It has, it's like a big blanket with a hole in the top and it covers your whole body, but it can also be used as a source of comfort. Paul's in prison. He doesn't have an electric blanket. He doesn't have even the most common things that are available to people who are in pain and who are suffering. It's caused some scholars to even think that the word that's translated garment or cloak might mean something else. That it might have been another big leather bag like a book bag. Remember, Paul was a tent maker and he worked in fabric, fabricating tents. Some cite Acts chapter 20, verse 6, but Paul's visit to Troas would have taken place several years earlier. Troas is ancient Troy, but it's also on the peninsula of Turkey. And if in your mind, or if you have a Bible map in the back of your Bible, there is Ephesus. And as you're making your way to the Hellespont, you have to come to Troas. And Troas is the place that most people would depart to go to different areas of the Mediterranean. For those of you who are from here, you know about I-25 and I-70, and Denver is the place where I-70 and I-25 cross. Troas was the crossroads of people going in every single direction, and so Paul is going, he understands that if Timothy is leaving, he's going to have to leave Ephesus. He's going to have to have to make his way to Troas. And so he asks him to stop and get the books and the parchments. Again, if you are a careful Bible student, you should ask the question, well, what's the difference between a book and a parchment? Good question. Are these... Letters, are these 
commentaries of the Old Testament? Are these actual books of the Old Testament that are a part of Paul's pastoral library? Are these blank pieces of parchment that Paul wishes to have so that he can make some final notes, so that he can write some final books? It's difficult to decide. The context seems to suggest that during his imprisonment, Paul wants to keep busy. That even in this situation, reading and writing are an important part of his ministry. We have no evidence that Paul produced any writings after this epistle. There's an interesting story associated with this verse. F.W. Newman, who was Cardinal Newman's younger brother, once asked J. N. Darby, how we could possibly be the poorer if this verse were not in the Bible. He says, look, parchments, books, do we, do we even know what it means? Do we even care what it means? Jan Darby replied, quote, <clears throat> I would have certainly have lost something, for this is the verse that saved me from selling my library. Every word depend on it is from the Spirit and is for eternal purpose. When I read this verse, I think exactly the same way. People ask me, what's the hardest part about the transition? What's the hardest part? Is it 20, almost 28 years of ministry? Is it all of the ministry that has taken place? What, what's the hardest part about not being the pastor of Calvary South Denver? And you know what the hardest part for me is? What am I going to do with my books? What am I going to do with my books? And Jonathan says, Dad, don't worry about your books. Don't worry about it. Those books, for me, are more than just books. They're a link to the past. They're a promise in the present about what I might be doing in the future. I think that that's what's happening in the text. We live in an age when people have multiple shoes, they have multiple garments, they have lots of books. And in the ancient world, a cloak was a very valuable thing and a book was even more valuable. And so when Paul asks for these items, he's not asking for his entire library, but for those treasures, those treasures that a Bible teacher and a Bible preacher needs. And so these requests reveal something about Paul. I want you to look just a little harder. Paul, like everyone else, finds comfort in friendship and relationship and people. But he also finds comfort, not just in precious people, but in parchments. I can't even tell you how happy that makes me because I love my books. And look at his final sorrow. Look what it says in verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he's greatly resisted our words. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20, Paul speaks of two people who abandoned the faith and who made life miserable. He talks about Hymenaeus. And Alexander, and he describes their position, and he writes, Whom I delivered to Satan, that they may not learn to blaspheme. We talked when we talked about that particular passage that that probably meant that under church discipline, they were expelled from the church. Could this be the same Alexander? What exactly did Alexander the coppersmith do? 
What did he do to cause Paul such grievous harm? There are several things that are important about Paul's disclosure. He names him by name. He invites the Lord to settle accounts. He says, may the Lord repay him according to his works. The reason why I think it's important that we understand that he names names is because sometimes it becomes important for pastors to talk about people who are causing grievous harm to the body of Christ, to Christianity in general, and may be causing harm to a church specifically. And note what Paul says. He says, may the Lord repay him. Not according to his intentions, but into the real harm that it caused Paul. Scholars have set, suggested a number of different possibilities. Some have suggested that this might have been the man who testified against Paul during his Roman imprisonment. Remember I told you a little bit that in the ancient world, when you wanted to bring somebody to trial, you had to publicly accuse them. It could very well be that Alexander the coppersmith was the person who calls Paul out in the marketplace and accuses him of all all of the accusations that could possibly be made against Paul and that when it comes time to go before what was called there, there were two kinds of people in, in Roman law you literally would stand trial not before a magistrate or a bureaucrat but before a very well-known lay person who was tasked by the Romans to adjudicate conflict. It's the literal beginning of the judicial system in Western civilization. But in, in order to do that you had to publicly uh, confront them and then you had to bring them to trial and it could very well be that it's during this time of trial that Paul is talking about that no one comes forth and advocates for Paul including Luke. Well why didn't Luke advocate for Paul? I'm going to suggest to you because he, he, he couldn't and the reason why is because he's a slave. Slaves have no judicial standing in the judicial system of ancient Rome. Connie Bear and Housen, who wrote in the 1880s, translates this verse, quote, Alexander the coppersmith charged me with much evil, unquote, and I think that that's right. Paul literally warns Timothy about this man and that he is trouble and that great resistance to Paul's words may be taken literally that he resists Paul and he serves as an advocate against him at his public trial. In verse 16, it says, At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. I'm going to suggest to you that this could mean one of two things. That he's talking about the first trial that had taken place years earlier or that he's talking about a second trial which is taking place right at that very moment but in the ancient world the trial consisted of two parts a preliminary trial and then the specific trial that would take place the first defense may be the first opportunity that he had to defend himself against the charges brought against him. Hence the idea that there is now an interim period where Paul gets to write this letter and ask Timothy, beg Timothy, to please come quickly. We know a great deal about Roman law in the first century, but it's never really been talked about, I think, from a biblical standpoint. And again, it's sad that no one stood with Paul. I'm going to suggest to you that most of the people that Paul is ministering to had no credentials. They weren't qualified to argue in Rome's judicial system. But the very fact that he says, no one stood with me, suggests to me that there were people who could have stood with him and who didn't. And it brings to mind what goes on in our life, huh? Because life consists of 
two kinds of people. Italian people and people who wish they were. No, those aren't the two kinds of people I know. I've told you this for years and years. The two kinds of people are the people who can help and the people who can't help. And sometimes, sometimes we pray. We pray and we say, Lord, which person am I? Am I a person who could help or not help? Clearly, there were some who could have stood with him who didn't. Again, this reminds me again of ministry. The people who you start with in ministry aren't always the people you end with. And if I can leave one more bit of advice to the pastors and leaders of this church, it's that the people who can do you the most good can also do you the most harm. And so you shouldn't be afraid. You shouldn't be afraid to enter into relationships and friendships. You should be weary, but make no mistake about it. The people who can help you the most can hurt you the most, but Paul takes a chance on them. The very fact that he's hurt by them means that he loved them and that he trusted them. So how do we deal with isolation, with abandonment? How do we deal when we come to a place in our life where we really need people to be a part of our life? Look what Paul does. Just like there's a final request and a final sorrow, there's also a final song. Look what it says in verse 17. But the Lord stood with me. And strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul was forsaken by men, but he was strengthened by the Lord. Do you know what this tells me? It tells me what I need to tell you. That when you're feeling alone, when you're feeling empty, when you're feeling like no one loves you or cares about you or is concerned about you, just remember what it says in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. In Isaiah 41, verse 10, it says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Paul it's interesting to me that word translated strengthen appears some eight times in the New Testament. In the book of Acts chapter 9 verse 22, Luke uses this very word to describe the beginning of Paul's public ministry. It says he increased in strength. It's used at the beginning of Paul's ministry and it's used at the end of Paul's ministry. It began in the strength of the Lord. It continued in the strength of the Lord. It ends in the strength of the Lord. When Paul says, I was delivered out of the mouth of a lion. Is that a literal lion? Was he thrown to the lions? Is this a reference to some Roman bureaucrat? Is this a reference to Nero himself? Some scholars believe that Paul is using this as a figure of speech, as a metaphor. Some people believe that he literally is delivered the first time by Nero for reasons that we don't necessarily know about. Some people believe it's just a metaphorical way of saying my trial has been postponed. That it has been postponed and it has yet to be adjudicated. 
when he says the Lord will deliver me from every work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom, we understand that deliverance can take a lot of different forms. Paul is familiar with the songs of deliverance in the Old Testament. In Exodus 15, Moses and the children of Israel sing, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider has been thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. This is my God. I will praise him. My father's God, I will exalt him. And in Psalm 33 verse 3 it says, Sing, sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. What's interesting again is again how Paul is dealing with loneliness and isolation. One of the ways that he's dealing with his loneliness and isolation is he asks for help. Another way that he deals with his loneliness and isolation is he sings a song. One of the ways I know that Mary is really, really happy is when she whistles. She'll be listening to music on the radio and she'll start singing the song. And I'm going to suggest to you that if you feel tingling in your left arm and chest pains, they say, take an aspirin and put it under your tongue to help mitigate against a heart attack that one of the ways that you can deal with isolation and abandonment and loneliness is you can pop praise in your mouth and sing a song, sing a song to the Lord, sing a song to Jesus. I wrote one for you. There is a kind of sorrow that lingers on and on. The wounded soul must borrow from praise to carry on. Praise the Lord, the coming King. Praise with hearts of fire. Praise the Lord with anthems bring the song that still inspires. Lonely, isolated, alone. Sing a song. Sing a song of praise. And that's exactly what Paul does. He sings a final song of praise to God be the glory. On Friday, Miss Mary and I went and saw Handel's Messiah. And you remember, those of you who are familiar with Handel's Messiah, there comes a point in the, in the presentation where everybody stands up and everybody sings, And he shall reign forever and ever. What's amazing about Handel's song is when you sing the scripture, to God be the glory, great things he has done. The song, forever and ever, is the strongest term possible in the Greek language to express the concept of eternity. It translates literally to the ages, of the ages. When I was reading this, I thought to myself, in one sense, there's no such thing. There's no such thing in eternity. Because eternity doesn't exist except it exists forever. How do we grasp a concept that has no beginning and no middle and no end. We are limited because we're human beings. We must of necessity express the concept of eternity in view of time. But there may be another way. There may be another way that we can grasp the concept forever and ever. The writer of Hebrews says... Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, forever. Yeah, Jesus is the same yesterday. Jesus is the same today. 
Jesus is the same forever. No wonder the writer John the Apostle says, He who has the Son has eternal life. If you have Jesus, if Jesus is in your heart, if Jesus is in your life, eternity has already begun. Eternity continues. Matthew Henry wrote, Be not afraid of saying too much on the praises of God. All the danger is saying too little, unquote. Is it possible to praise God too much? Erwin Lutzer wrote, You don't learn to praise in a day, especially since you may have been complaining for years. New habits take time to develop. But you can begin today. You can practice tomorrow and the next day until it becomes a part of you. And I want you to understand something. That if loneliness, darkness, emptiness finds its way inside of your heart, the surest, the surest way to make it go away is to sing. I will sing of the goodness of the Lord forever. It's almost impossible to praise the Lord and remain in darkness. So how do you deal with loneliness or isolation? Do what Paul did. Ask for help. It's okay. It's okay to say to the people that you care about, I need you. I need you in my life. I want you in my life. Does it surprise you that someone like Paul would ask for help? Does it surprise you that someone like Paul would ask for articles of comfort? Because guess what? Help sometimes means making friends. And I'm so sorry to have to tell you this. And keeping friends. Friends are rare, ladies and gentlemen. If you've made a friend, do whatever you can to hold on to them. Friends are few and rare. Make friends. Keep friends. And then find your comfort. Most of all, in Jesus, sing to him. The Lord will strengthen you. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this passage of scripture. Lord, we pray that like Paul, when the moment comes, when the time is at hand, that we won't be afraid or too proud to ask for help, to make friends and keep friends. Lord, we pray that we could hide songs of praise inside of our heart, that we can sing a new song, that there is a kind of sorrow that lingers on and on, the wounded soul must borrow from praise to carry on, And so we praise the Lord, the coming King. We praise with hearts on fire and praise the Lord with anthem. Bring those songs that still inspire. Lord, fill our hearts with songs of joy. In Jesus' name, amen.